against the Hun or somebody over in the Europe's uh, dreaming of one day maybe being a soldier. And that's what my father taught me. First of all, to go for the top. Don't settle for second best. You shoot for the top or the pole. And then also to be a, an officer in the United States Army was the best way to shoot for the top there in, in your government service. So it was always my goal to attend the uh, military academy at West Point, New York and become an officer in the United States Army. At age 12, as I said, there was, a, as usual in the spring and summer, there was some new variety of disease making its way up the coast of the Carolinas from down in the Floridas. And uh, this particular year, it happened to be a bad strain of cholera. It was wiping people out right and left. So my father had uh, tired of dodging uh, one disease after another every spring and sought to get his family away from that by buying a little piece of land just west of Huntsville, Alabama to get his family a little further inland and away from the coastal mosquitoes and the, the diseases that they bring. So uh, we purchased the land and we got the family moved and settled in and my father went back down to Augusta, Georgia to settle up some business affairs and caught the cholera he had sought to avoid and passed away. So at age 12, I'm now the man of the house. I'm the oldest son. So uh, I'm, I'm without a father. But I never was without his teachings and his guidance. And that always go for the top, don't settle for anything less. So West Point was still my goal, and I was determined to go to West Point. But now I didn't know how I was going to do that, not even being a resident of Georgia anymore. We had uh, people who I'm sure would have recommended me to West Point, but uh, now that was all over. But fortunately, my mother uh, knew some people down in Montgomery, and uh, got me appointed to West Point uh, with support and then proper letters. So I was able at age 18 to report to West Point, New York, the dream of my life to become an officer in the United States Army. And I signed up and gave my oath and promise, and I was in the class of 42. And then my four years at West Point, now I made a lot of fast friends. Some of those friends I'm afraid I will meet sooner or later across that small deadly space others I'm lucky to serve with even today. Some of the friends that I remember quite quite well, one particular little fellow, a little short guy from up near Ohio, named Hiram Ulysses Grant. Now, now Grant, Grant got there, he was a year behind me, he was in class of 43, and the rules at any military academy is upperclassmen do not associate with lowerclassmen unless it's an official business. <laughs> Uh, you want a soldier to do something, you tell him not to do it. That's the first thing he's going to do. But Sam and I thought alike. Uh, we acted alike. We both loved riding horses, ripping out through the woods, jumping over tree stumps, and just having a big time outdoors. So we understood each other in that light, but we weren't allowed to actually sit and talk about it on post. Luckily, there was a little place outside the back gate out there called Benny Havens. This, this fellow named Benny Havens, he and his wife had set up shop in their house out there in the middle of the woods, literally. And uh, what they were able to do was sell uh, alcoholic imbibement to the cadets out of West Point, which was strictly illegal, but he didn't live on post. So as far as he was concerned, he wasn't breaking the law, but as far as the officers at the West Point, us cadets were definitely breaking the law. So we knew, knew better than to get caught. Well, Benny Havens or his wife would always make it a point to stand near the front door and if they saw anybody coming down from the post that looked like a regular officer, they would warn all the cadets inside to get out the back door before they came in. And a lot of people just barely missed ruining a good career right there at Benny Havens. Sometimes it was close because if you uh, have been to the bottle too many times, it's hard to find that back door. <laughs> I can attest to that. And then, of course, get the footprints up your back from the fellow behind you who happens to run faster than you. But back to the post we would, and of course we had to come back and show up without any mud on our uniform from falling down on the way back. And luckily, most of us got through with it thanks to our good friend, Benny Havens. And uh, the reason I bring this up about Benny Havens is it gave me a place and Sam Grant a place to sit and talk and become very tight, fast friends. We could not do it on post, but at Benny Havens there were no rules, except don't get caught because you won't be back the next day. So Grant, uh, Grant and I became very, very good friends. Now, one thing about West Point is the first thing you'll do is pick up a sobriquet, a nickname. 
Now, my nickname was Pete, but that came from my father, not at West Point. But it got well known at West Point, so everybody called me that. Uh, old uh, Grant was called Sam. They, there seemed to be no rhyme or reason where these little nicknames came from. So, old Grant, he's Sam, he is. So, Sam and I got on famously. And as I said, that was a year ahead of him and graduated in 1842. My first posting was at a little place called Ebb, Jefferson Barracks out in St. Louis, Missouri. And after I had been there one year, guess who should show up? Sam Grant at Jefferson Barracks. However, Sam Grant was not in the same unit I was in. I was posted as a brevet lieutenant in the 4th Infantry Brigade. Sam was posted across the, the, on the other side of the post there. We did see each other once in a while. We, of course, we knew each other was around but it's not like we were old buddies like it was back in the, in the cadet days. We just didn't work. I didn't have the same schedules, I, I guess you can say. So uh, Sam and I, uh, we, we still got along. We considered ourselves friends. And um, by saying that, I would like to say to all of you that I will not take the blame for introducing Sam Grant to my fifth cousin, Ms. Julia Dent. Mm -mm. You're not going to blame that on me. That was all him. Now, as I understand it from Sam, it was her brother who actually introduced her to Sam. And five years later, I had the honor of serving as groomsman at Sam's wedding to my fifth cousin, Miss Julia Dent, from the Dent family down in Southern Maryland. So I'm almost kin to Sam. And uh, as we went along there, while well, I was uh, then removed shortly after that from uh, the post of Jefferson Barracks down to the Floridas, then uh, back out west for a time, the Indian Wars, and then back uh, east uh, at a couple of different posts. Then back out west again, out near Wyoming and Wyoming Territory for a very short time. And then uh, my luck changed. I was stationed at Carlisle Barracks, Pennsylvania, as a recruiter. And then on, from there on up to Poughkeepsie, New York, where again I served as recruiter. Now, about the, this time, my children are starting to get of school age, and that's become one of my primary concerns, is to make sure they have the best opportunity, at least the opportunity that I had, if not better. So I petitioned the Army to keep me there at Poughkeepsie, New York, as a recruiter, rather than send me on somewhere else, as it was coming time for my first term there to be up. And, of course, the Army, in its uh, infinite wisdom, in view of my long uh, service, an honorable service, promptly sent me to Albuquerque, New Mexico. I don't know if that was a uh, punishment or what, but uh, you don't have to like it in the Army. You just have to do it. And you just keep, you learn to keep your mouth shut about it. So my family wasn't too happy about it to begin with, but you know what? Once we got out there to Albuquerque, we discovered we were in the middle of a paradise, which was in the middle of a desert. We were quite removed from everybody else. But the schools on that post were the most excellent schools I think my kids have ever attended. I believe so. So we were quite happy. My wife actually had kin folks down in El Paso, which was uh, about a day's ride away. So we weren't totally isolated from friends and family. And, of course, the people on post were all just as friendly and tight-knit since we were the only people there in one little place. So it actually turned into an excellent posting. For me, and I was served there. I had made the major at the time, and it was serving the United States Army as a paymaster for that area. Now, about the time I made major, we started hearing rumblings from back east. Now, keep in mind, when you're out in Albuquerque, New Mexico, news is about a month late. So, when you hear about something that they said happened yesterday, it happened last month, and we had to kind of keep that in mind that that time frame. So, we started hearing these rumblings about certain states uh, getting ready to secede or pull out from the Union of the United States. And of course South Carolina was one of them. That didn't surprise us. She's uh, threatened to do that twice before. But uh, under one threat or another, uh, it never actually happened. And we all thought and hoped that it wouldn't happen this time, that diplomacy somehow would save the day. Until the word finally came in January of 1861 that the previous December, South Carolina had indeed seceded from the Union. And we all knew the bad news coming there because we knew good and well that no, no southern states, even though they might not want to secede, they're not going to let South Carolina sit out there by herself. That we knew it was going to be a cascading of states, states after that, one after the other. 
until all the southern states had come out. And sure enough, it didn't take long. Within a week, other states were pulling out. Georgia, Alabama, Tennessee, Mississippi, Louisiana, all the Carolinas, and finally Virginia. And then the last one actually was Tennessee. And all the states had come out, 11 of them, to join with South Carolina and form the Confederate States of America. Now, I read one time where old Abraham Lincoln made a statement that a house divided against itself shall not stand. Well, now, that's not the way we saw it down south. A bunch of ignorant southerners, as some of the folks up north like to call us, what we saw was not a house divided against itself. We saw two houses next door to each other. One family had simply moved out of this house and moved next door, and we can't figure out why we can't get along with our neighbors. Well, that's all we want to do is set up trade relations with them, as Canada had done with the United States. Why in the world can't we do that? But Mr. Lincoln said, no, sir. He came next door with the gun drawn, and that bayonet point was forcing us to move back in with him. Essentially, that's the way we saw it. Well, we had already gone through all the trial and tribulation of pulling out, and we weren't about to give up yet. We were, we were pulled out. We have every legal right to do so. We have every moral right to do so. And that's exactly what we did. We didn't do it on a whim. It wasn't done because somebody just got tired of the people next door. No, nothing like that. It was the fact that we had been made promises in the Constitution of the United States and could enumerate those promises which had been broken not once, but many times, one right after another. One of them was economics. When the southern states pulled out uh, in December of 1860, when South Carolina pulled out, 81 cents out of every dollar that was going into the federal treasury came from tariffs on southern ports. Yeah, that aggravated the northern government because they just lost 81 cents out of every dollar. Now, how are they going to make it up? Because they don't have many deep water ports up there. And a lot of them freeze up during the winter. Down south, you don't worry about that. But I'm, I'm not going to stand and talk about politics all day. That's simply where we are down south. And that is why this late business and unpleasantness has begun. <laughs> If somebody has decided we do not have the right to do that, we decided we did, and now we are forcing the issue at the point of a gun and a sword. So, after my trip to uh, um, Albuquerque, New Mexico, and getting word that uh, everybody had pulled out down in the south, and uh, it was the south now was actually a separate nation unto itself, Confederate States of America instead of United States of America, I had a decision to make, but luckily it was made for me. It's not like it took the pressure off my shoulders, absolutely not. But the decision had to be made, but I could make no decision but one, and that is to resign my commission in the United States Army. The commission that I had looked for and hoped for since I was a little boy and finally got, went to West Point and graduated, not top of my class, but not bottom either. Better than ticket. About halfway down the basement steps, but uh, <laughs> graduated I did. And I was brevetant lieutenant, just as good as all the ones that graduated at the top. That's the way I looked at it. At least I graduated and I'm out of here and I have my commission. But now I'm forced to resign my commission in the United States Army because, as General Lee put it, and I don't think I can put it better, I, was, I cannot raise my sword against my nation of, with Virginia for him and against my friends and my family. And that's exactly the way we looked at it. That Georgia and Alabama and, and or South Carolina being my birth state, that was my nation. That was my home. That's where my friends and my family resided and came from. And to, just the fact that I remained in the United States Army one day after another meant that effectively I was raising my sword against my family and my friends and my nation down south. It's not like I wanted to go to war with anybody. I didn't believe that ought to be the way we did it. I thought diplomacy should rule, but somebody else that didn't bother to ask me uh, went ahead and pulled, the, uh, pulled out of the uh, United States anyway, and here it is. The situation was handed me the way it is, and I, ha I have no power to change it but to go along and support it as best I can. I would love to support the United States, but I can no longer do that without unsupporting my nation, the South. So that's where I am on the feeling of North and South. I love the United States of America, but I cannot go to war against my family and my friends and my nation 
South Carolina, Georgia, and Alabama. I'm kind of spread across the whole southern tier. I have more to defend than a lot of other folks that were born and raised in one state, I guess you could say. So here we are going to war. I resigned my commission effectively the first day of June, 1861. And I departed five days later from Albuquerque, New Mexico, with going down to uh, through El Paso and uh, getting my wife and children installed with her kinfolks down there, where I caught a boat at Corpus Christi on my way to Montgomery, Alabama. I had written a letter to Alabama offering her my services as, a, as an officer, since she is the one that sent me to West Point. It was only right. And Alabama had written me back saying, we'll be uh, glad to have you. We will uh, assure you a lieutenant colonel's rank. And I was hoping maybe a paymaster's job once I got there, since that's what I know. That's what I've been doing for a uh, uh, time. Well, on the boat, on the way to uh, New Orleans, where we'd catch the stage back up to uh, Montgomery, the capital of the Confederacy, I ran into three Texas boys, one named Lubbock, one named Terry, and another fellow named Goree, Thomas Jewett Goree. I don't know what it is about this man, I can't tell you to, till today, but there was some presence about this man and intelligence, but yet you wouldn't, you wouldn't think he was a doctor or a lawyer just to talk to him. The man was just incredibly intelligent, but he also had a presence about him, and that's about all I can say. Tom Gorey is now one of my aide-de-camps and has been ever since uh, we met on the boat that day, as far as I was concerned. Once I became the commander, I, of course, kept Tom Gorey with me as my aide-de-camp, and he has served me and is serving me very, very well. Well, one of the things that he told me while we were on the boat and getting acquainted was, why are you going to Alabama? I said, well, that's where I wrote the letter, the capital of the Confederacy. That's when I found out the capital of the Confederacy wasn't there anymore. They had moved it to Richmond. Remember, I, things are a month late out in Albuquerque. So now I've changed the plans. He talked me into going. I was going to go to Alabama anyway. But uh, Tom Gorey actually talked me into going with them. They were going to Richmond, the capital of the Confederacy, and offered their services to her as best they could be applied. And he kept telling me, he said, you're a West Point graduate. You've got to go to Richmond and seek audience with the president. And I said, well, the president's not going to want to talk to me. He said, you're a West Point graduate. And you've got honorable length of service. You served in Mexico with honor. You were wounded in your service down there. Yes, sir, President Davis will want to see you. So I make my way to Richmond, and I ask and sought service with uh, President Davis. And he granted me audience. And when I came out of there, I was a brigadier general in the Confederate States of America, Confederate States Army. I guess I did myself a little bit of a favor by uh, upping the rank. But considering the responsibilities that went along with that increased rank, sometimes I'm not really so sure. I'm proud to do it, and I hope to goodness that I can do it well, and continue to do it well. But uh, sometimes it would be nice to be sitting in a paymaster's office down in Montgomery, Alabama, and not worry too much about where that next uh, cannon projectile is going to land. But anyway, a Brigadier General I am, and I'm uh, within uh, 10 days' time, I'm sent out to a little place called Manassas Junction, Virginia. I had never heard of the place, and when I got there, I understood why. It wasn't big enough to hear about it. But it was a, one of the most important places in the state of Virginia because it was a junction for five railroads. It went five different directions. And that's exactly what the Confederate states said that the Yankees want. That's why they're going to want to take this place. They're not after Richmond yet. They want to take this place so they can control the railroads. This was actually the Atlanta of the north, the northern tier of states, the Atlanta of Virginia because of the railroad terminus uh, that were uh, stationed there. So I was sent down there along with several other new uh, uh, brevet lieutenants in charge of a little unit, and I was put in charge of the 4th Infantry Brigade. Now, that's not the same one I was a member of out in uh, Jefferson Barracks. The 4th Brigade was mine, and it consisted of the 1st, the 11th, and the 17th Virginia Regiments. And I was posted at a ford along Bull Run Creek. There were three fords about three miles east of the town, down the creek. Well, General Bonham was to my left on the first ford. I was at what they call Blackburn's Ford, right in the center. And D.R. Jones, what I call neighbor Jones from the days back at the West Point, was off to my right guarding that ford. I, we didn't know which ford they were going to take, if they were going to take a ford at all. But we assumed they would not come right down the middle of town, that they would try to snake around and take us by flank and rear. So that meant coming across one of those fords because Bull Run Creek can't be waded. Not with soldiers with powder, it can't. So we know they're going to have to take a forward somewhere. And sure enough, 
Two days later, here they come. And they came, boom, right at Blackburn's Ford. They didn't come left or right, they all came right at me. Erwin McDowell had sent his blue-suited troopers after these boys from this uprising down south, and we're going to whip their tails and send them back home and show them what happens to people who want to disturb the peace and tranquility of the United States. Well, they hit us that morning, came across the ford, and we whipped them within 10 minutes and sent them back across the creek. They regrouped and came back across again. And we went back and forth across that creek that day five times. But the fifth time, they threw their weapons down for the most part and lit out running or walking or crawling or whatever they could do back towards Centerville. We had them on the run. It was over. We had whipped them. So I grouped my, my 4th Brigade up and we lit out after them across, splashing across the ford. And just as I got probably a hundred yards across to the, the north side of the creek, here come a man on a leather, a leather horse telling me that I got to retreat back across the creek. And I come down off my horse, I slammed my hat on the ground, I said, retreat? Hell, we've broken these people all to pieces. They're running, they've thrown their guns down, all we got to do is chase them back to Centerville, this thing will be over with by dark. Well, about the time I'm uh, 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 ushering up a few new swear words to, uh, uh, to escort those, here come another man up from Beauregard himself telling me that there's suspected federal cavalry action down off our right, and we need to get back across the creek. Well, like I said, in the Army, you don't have to like it, but you've got to do it. And I sure didn't like it. I remember my chief of staff reminding me that night that he was amazed that the grass wasn't scorched three feet around me from the language that escaped me. But we had these people on the run. They were headed back home. They left their guns on the ground. It was over. They had had enough. No, no. This was not just a little uprising uh, or disagreement from down south. They figured those boys mean to fight, and they're on their home ground. And that's another thing that probably gave us a little wherewithal to withstand that fight that day is because we weren't up in Pennsylvania or New York trying to take property away from these Yankees. They were down in Virginia trying to take our property away from us. And that would not be stood for. Absolutely not. That was our home and our heart. And that's what we were fighting against, and we weren't about to quit. Well, anyway, I had to come back across, and sure enough, as luck would have it, I guess you could call it luck, that uh, federal cavalry that they were worried about was actually a bunch of uh, militiamen from Virginia that were wearing blue uniforms. Quite a few of them had adopted the blue from the days of the United States Army, and that's all it was. And here we had let the Army go. You know, though, the strangest thing that that night that I, I learned, okay, yeah, we whipped them, we can do it again tomorrow, if they hit us and if they hit Bonham or hit neighbor Jones, he'll do the same thing. But the thing that amazed me most that night, I used to sit and wonder on my way uh, across the waterway there in the boat, leaving the United States Army and joining the Confederate States Army, how long it would take me to run into some of my old friends from West Point on that small deadly space across looking at me down the barrel of a gun that we used to share so much, so, such good times with. That evening I found out that the one who led those troops against me that day was a man named Israel Richardson. He was my roommate for three of my four years at West Point. So it didn't take long. The very first time guns were fired in anger in that state, there he was up against me. I didn't know it that day. I'm glad I didn't. It might have made a difference. I don't know. In, in the way I thought about shooting and killing that man up on that horse. But from my distance, I couldn't tell who it was. But anyway, Manassas came and went. We, we sent them packing. We gave them different ideas. We showed them that this was not going to be a two-day or a three-week war. This was going to hold out. I even told a fellow one time, this thing may go for five years. And if it goes for longer than that, you can look for a dictatorship. Because this thing was serious. We weren't about to give up, and they knew it by now. I guess it was, it's... it's, it's it's nice always to see your enemy fleeing before you with his back to you, that you've whipped him, you've run him from the field. But when he leaves the field, then you have to look around. We won. We took the day. What do we have? We didn't come here to take Virginia away from them. We already did. Virginia belonged to us to start with. All we did is secede with it. And here they come invading it. We were defending our home against a foreign invader. That's exactly the way we looked at it. They were from a foreign country coming into our front yard. 
But the thing is, here we have whooped these people, but it's a victory, but it's a hollow victory, a pyrrhic victory as it's known. Because you whipped them, yeah, you whipped them good and proper. But tomorrow, where are you going to fight? Right here? Could be. They might regroup and hit us again right here tomorrow. Or maybe right here at Blackburn Ford again, thinking they could do something different. It didn't. It didn't happen. It was about six days later when they regrouped and decided not to come across the fords, but move around to our the Confederate left flank down through Sudley Springs. And by that time, Joe Johnson had got there with his troops from the valley, using the railroads to get them in. And uh, Shanks Evans was there to give them a warm welcome, which we pushed him out again. And this time, this time, people in Washington had time to find out about it. And they packed all their picnic lunches and their senators and congressmen in their wagons with their blankets spread out on the hillside, going to watch the Federals whip these uh, untidy boys from down south. Well, it happened again. They run over each other. Uh, troopers running over wagons trying to get across that one little bridge down there trying to get out of town before they got shot in the back we whipped them again where would it happen next time well we went through the peninsula campaign they put McClellan in charge and uh, McClellan was an excellent organizer but he didn't know anything about fighting evidently because he didn't do a lot of it so we fought him for seven straight days pushing him back down the peninsula until finally a little place called Malvern Hill. Malvern Hill, they were able to get their guns in position by the house up on top of that hill, and we had nothing but open ground uphill to come out of. And that's exactly what we did. You know, you hear a lot about old Thomas Jackson, old Stonewall Jackson. What a great soldier he is. But I'm going to tell you, he is a great soldier. I'm not up here to den denigrate anybody, especially Tom Jackson. But Jackson marched right by us. He was coming in from the valley. Myself and A.P. Hill was up against Fitz John Porter's Federals, and we were having it out that day and had been at it for four hours. Tom Jackson marched within a mile of us and went into bivouac because it was a Sunday. He didn't He didn't pitch in. Had he pitched in, we most certainly would have sent Fitz John Porter running. But no, we had to fight the rest of the day just because Jackson chose not to fight on a Sunday. He could hear the, the rattle of the musketry from where he was but he didn't show up. And two or three other times during that, that seven days campaign, he didn't show up until late, much much too late in some cases to really be effective. So Tom Jackson is an excellent officer, but he's not perfect as some of these uh, manuscripts and um, uh, newspapers and periodicals might have you believe. Don't go thinking that Thomas Jackson is the second person in history to walk on water. It does not happen, I can tell you. He is a good man, he's an excellent commander. But I don't worship that man. He does have his failures, as do I. And the reason I bring this the Peninsula campaign up is that at Malvern Hill, the Federals were looking to do one thing, and that's to get their men back behind that house at Malvern Hill, back down to Harrison's Landing, where they were going to load up on gunboats, we had found out, and take them down to Fortress Monroe on the point of the Peninsula, load them up on ships, and take them back to Washington. General Lee had heard about this, and other news that was coming out of Washington, and with General Lee's expert, uh, keen military mind, he was able to put this together. We know what they're up to. The president is tired of fooling with McClellan. He's not going to do anything, obviously, except sit in the mud and holler for more men. So get him back up to Washington, because at Washington, at this very minute, Pope had been brought in from the Indian Wars out west. And Pope was nothing but a braggart and a liar, but somebody hoped he would fight and maybe get something done. Lincoln's idea was to take McClellan's forces, get them back up the Potomac, and link them up with Pope's army of 60,000 men that's sitting there. That's the ones that ran from Manassas to begin with, for the most part. Now we're going to be looking at about 150 to 160,000 men hitting us at Manassas again. General Lee said, this cannot stand because we, we will be so outnumbered, uh, we'll never be able to stand against this. So we need to get our army out of here immediately. So Jackson's men were known to be the fast movers. They were actually called at one time foot cavalry because instead of covering 20 miles a day, many times it was 30 to 32 miles a day on foot. Now you see why they call them foot cavalry. They hated Tom Jackson, but they loved him in the evenings around the campfire because they knew he was going to give them a victory. So Jackson took his men and headed up the valley on the, on the way back up toward Manassas Junction where we had fought uh, the previous year. Thirteen months after that first fight at Manassas, 
And here we are back again up against Pope. We did whip him. We whipped him a good one before McClellan got there. And by the time McClellan got there, Pope was already fired because of his ineptness uh, to stand up against Robert E. Lee, and he's gone back out west, and we never heard from him again. Uh, McClellan continued to be McClellan. And after Second Manassas was such a rousing victory on General Lee's part, it was decided that some of our enlistments have started to come up a little short. So we need to, to get into a state that has not provided a lot of people. That state was Maryland. General Lee said we need to go into Maryland and make sure that the people in Maryland understand what we are fighting for and what started this business to start with, what we're doing up here. Make sure that the, what they're being told by the federal government up in Washington City is not right. That is not what we're up to. We're not trying to take Washington from them. That was never one of our ideas. Never. We don't want it. Let them have it. We got Richmond. And it's brand new. All we wanted to do is make sure Maryland understood. And we felt sure, General Lee felt sure, that once they do understand and hear the truth, they will join us in ranks. They will join us in droves. We will have the manpower influx that we need at this time. Well... So far, we haven't seen a lot of it. Right now, the way things stand, we can count just about as many federal units from Maryland as we can Confederate units. The state seems to be divided. It was actually a state that was on the verge of secession until Lincoln had everybody thrown in jail without habeas corpus, right? Uh, he even threatened to have uh, Chief Justice Taney arrested. But uh, <laughs> thanks to uh, a U.S. Marshal who sent over to do it, he said, I I'm not, I'm not getting into that. I'm not throwing Chief Justice of the United States in jail. So that never happened. But Lincoln is trying his best to make sure that Maryland does not secede. And all we say, well, okay, secede or not secede, that's what they do in their government. We don't care about that. What we want to know is the truth, and hopefully they'll join with us. And that, my friends, is what we're doing up here at Sharpsburg. We have met McClellan again on this field, and we have whipped him so far. Now we're going to go at it again today. And I dare say, if we continue the way we've been going, we're going to push him back off the field today, even though we're outnumbered two to one. He has almost twice the number of men that we have. But what we saw yesterday was he didn't use all of them. He saw that we were pushing him back yesterday uh, around the edge of the town. He actually sent part of it down there at the Rohrbach Bridge, tried to cross a covered bridge, and was held back by 500 Georgians dug in holes up on the side of a hill. 500 Georgians held off 2,000 Federals trying to cross the bridge till finally somebody got the idea, hey, we go right down here about 100 yards and ford the, the creek. We don't have to use the bridge. And when they did that, of course, uh, okay, the, the, the game is up for the day. But that's what we're up against with McClellan. The man is defeatable. And that's what General Lee is hoping to do here. I thank you so very much for your attention and your attention. Supposed to have an hour here, but I understand it's going to be a battle at 11 o'clock. So a few minutes before 11, I understand, you know, people kind of getting up and heading that way because that's got to be more exciting than me. <laughs> but what we're going to do right now is I'm coming out of first person. This is not Long Street anymore. This is not 1862 anymore. This is the present day. I'm Ron Hawkins. I grew up in Rome, Georgia, about 60 miles from where Long Street finished out his life in Gainesville, Georgia. I'm an electrical engineer. I work for the Department of the Navy in my spare time. <laughs> uh, so what we're going to do is open it up to questions. And the reason I've come out of first person is because if I don't, and I'm still Longstreet in October or September of 1862, the first question somebody's going to ask is, when did you die? <laughs> well, obviously I haven't done that yet. Maybe you know something I don't. So in order to keep that confusion down, uh, we'll open it up to any questions or comments, and I trust that somebody will run me off. Yep, George King. He'll run me off the stage when the time comes. But until then, let's have any question you have. Remember, the only dumb one's the one you didn't ask. There's yes. a comment. Great job. Thank you, sir. Sir, how did you get started as a general? How, oh, the question was, how did I get started in training the general? I'm going to try to make these quick so we can move along. Uh, when I was in high school, in my junior year, I had to do a paper on a famous Civil War personage. Well, I lived in Georgia, North Georgia at that. I said, I'm going to pick a Georgian. Well, somebody else had already picked Gordon and a few others from down that way. 
And I run up on this name of James Longstreet. And I started doing research on him. I actually went to Gainesville, but couldn't find a lot of information on him over there. Some information about his family since he lived there, of course. But uh, what information I could find on Longstreet, all it was telling me was all the bad things that Longstreet did. Oh my goodness, he disobeyed Lee's order at Gettysburg. He dragged his feet at Gettysburg. Uh, he lost the war entirely. And I figured, well, okay, this guy's a pretty bad guy. But nowhere could I find any information that said where somebody had chastised him because of that. And I'm thinking, well, this man did all these bad, rotten things, but General Lee and nobody else had anything bad to say about it. But then I found out in February of 64, February of 1864, the Confederate Congress bestowed upon James Longstreet an award praising him for his brave, braveness in battle during the previous year. That was 1863. That the year of Gettysburg. So now if Longstreet had a tail, like you would think he did, the way people talk about him, and all these bad things he did on all the things he didn't do, why did he not only get, not get punished, but he also got an award for, for braveness in battle from the Confederate Congress without being asked? That told me something was wrong. Something's up. Somebody's using this man as a scapegoat. And I believe that to this day. Well, it's getting better. Movies like Gettysburg brought out the true character uh, of, of Longstreet. I believe Berenger could, uh, couldn't have been better at what he did if you saw that movie. If you want to know what Longstreet acted like and how he spoke, that, that's a good, good place to see him. And that's how I got started doing it, because I saw an underdog from Georgia with a legacy that should have lived, outlived generations, but was being torn apart by a few people who wanted merely to sell books. And I thought, okay, this this is my character. And that was in 1966. I did it myself there. 17 years ago, I figured, okay, I've studied a good bit now. I'm not stopping, but it's now time to get the uniform and start the portrayal. Good, good. Okay. You do a wonderful job. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What's up? Oh, what did you do after the war? Okay, the question was, what did Longstreet do after the war? Uh, right after Appomattox, Longstreet went down to, uh, to Georgia and visited with relatives for a while. He ended up in New Orleans where he set himself up in the cotton brokerage business and insurance business and was doing very, very well because he was insuring ships and their cargo. And of course with the uh, embargo, I mean the blockade gone, sh shipping has opened up wide open. So Longstreet was doing well in business, but he let his politics get in the way. He announced that he was a Republican in the middle of New Orleans, in the middle of Reconstruction. Folks, if you like the war, you love Reconstruction. And, yeah, Longstreet became known as a turncoat, a scalawag, a traitor. And uh, the thing that, the straw that broke the camel's back was Longstreet was also appointed as a uh, port authority inspector for the port of New Orleans. Well, an ancillary job that came along with that is he was made commander of the local militia sort of like city police there in, in New Orleans. And there was a riot broke out by what they call the Crescent City White League. I can does not describe it any better than it was a white supremacist group because their idea was to put these uppity blacks back where they thought they belonged. We're not going to put up with this just because the federal government says so. We are in New Orleans. Well, Longstreet is commander of the militia. It's his job to quell the riot. Folks, this was no street fight. Forty-two people died in this. It started right there in Jackson Square. Longstreet sent the militia on them. But guess what? About 90% of the militia was freed blacks. Ooh. Now you see what's happened? That's Longstreet, the turncoats, Galloway, uh, traitor Longstreet is sick of these uppity blacks on us whites. Oh boy, things didn't go good for Longstreet then. It was 1875 and it got so bad that people wouldn't even sit on the same church pew with him and his family. So he finally sold all his holdings in New Orleans, moved to Washington, D.C., where he served as commissioner of railroads for a short time, then ambassador, they called it minister of Turkey then, to the country of Turkey. And then he uh, did serve, he served there a year and a half and came back to Gainesville, Georgia, uh, late in years, bought a little hotel down there called the Piedmont Hotel near the railroad depot, and ran that hotel and also served as postmaster for that area until his death in January, three days short of his 83rd birthday of 1904.
Yes, sir. Do you, can you talk about his time in Istanbul with the Ottoman Empire? Do you, do you like his time there? Do you see doing anything interesting yeah. for the U.S. Yeah, yeah. policy? Yeah, the, the question was his time in, uh, when he was in Istanbul uh, as minister to Turkey. Did he enjoy that? I, I'm sure he did because he didn't do a whole lot of uh, anything else. Uh, Longstreet it didn't take him long to find out he was in the wrong shop. He was not cut out to be this diplomat person. He spent a lot of time traveling, and a lot of people saw it back in the States that he's not really doing much. Um, whether that's true or not, I don't know. It depends on what was expected of him, and we can't seem to really determine that. But one thing that Longstreet did, and we have him to thank to this day, that up until the time Longstreet was there in Istanbul, Turkey, nobody, I mean nobody from another country, archaeologist-wise, were allowed to come into Turkey and work on these biblical digs that they knew were there. The Turkish government would not allow it. Longstreet convinced them that nobody's trying to take anything away from you. We, would, we just want to dig it up, clean it off, study it, and it's yours. And to this day, we have Longstreet to thank the fact that these archaeologists can come and go in Turkey and work these biblical digs. A lot of information has come out of that.